Hi everyone, this week we are going to um, talk about international trade. It is another vast topic, so again, I will be scratching the surface. I will talk about, uh, first of all, um, what international trade studies, what are the main questions. Then I will go into a couple of empirical facts about Canada's trade partners and Canada's main exports and imports. Then I will talk about the seminal theory of international trade. There has been many, many theoretical contributions in this field. I will talk about one of the first main big contributions whose insight and um, intuition still remains to this day. Finally, I will talk about protectionism as a way for country to protect themselves from international competition. I will look at the impact of one protectionist measure, an import tariff, and uh, we will look at whether it's good for a country to um, impose a tariff or not. First of all, the usual disclaimer. I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. If I see this content uploaded online, I will take it down and report whoever posted it. So, international trade studies trade patterns between different countries. First of all, why does a country export certain products and import others? We are going to go through a couple of different uh, um, possible reasons why a country would export a certain product and import another. Then comes the question of who do countries trade with and why? Is it only due to geographical location? Is it due to language? Is it due to um, common culture? Is it due to diplomatic relationships? And so on. What role do recent technological innovations play in trade patterns? The emergence of information and technology, um, the information technologies and communication technologies made international trade even smoother than before. And we can already think about um, what the next wave of information technologies innovations are, um, how they are going to change the landscape of international trade. How recent is globalization? Well, that's a pretty well documented um, phenomenon. So we know that globalization is not as recent as most people think. Most people think that globalization is a 20, 30, maybe 40 years old process, where in fact it's around 200 years old. It's just that globalization has known different phases, different waves, um, due to different phenomena, in particular the emergence of some uh, innovations, some technologies, but globalization in itself is not such and such a recent phenomenon. It accelerated recently, over the past 20 years, that's for sure, but it started a long time ago. Before I get into some empirical facts, let's get into some very, very basic definitions so that we know what we are talking about. First of all, a country exports if it sells to a foreign country. A country imports if it buys from a foreign country. So, if Canada sells something to the US, that would be export. If Canada buys something from the US, that would be an import. The balance of trade is the difference between exports and imports. We often look at this measure to look at the uh, trade situation of countries. A positive balance means that a country exports more than it imports. A negative balance means that it imports, buys, more than it exports, more than it sells abroad. Another common measure to look at the situation of a country in terms of international trade is the terms of trade. It is the ratio of export prices to import prices. 
often. We look at how terms of trade evolve, either over time or after a, um, after a certain event, and so on, to see how, um, how favorable or not favorable position a country is. So, terms of trade are good if export prices are high relative to import prices. On the other hand, if import prices are relatively high as opposed to export prices, terms of trade will be low or we will say that they deteriorate. Last term, we talk about gains from trade if trade leads to an increase in consumer surplus and producer surplus together. It is very important. Consumer surplus and producer surplus is pretty much total surplus if we don't count government revenue, if there is any. So we talk about gains from trade if total surplus increases as a whole. Note that it could be that consumer surplus increases and producer surplus decreases as long as consumer surplus increases more than producer surplus decreases, then we will talk about gains from trade. But trade, most of the time, doesn't lead to um, winners all across the board. Often, they are gains from trade, but also pains from trade for others. Couple of facts about Canada. So, in 2019, Canada exports in decreasing order of importance. So it exports to the US first. So the US is the uh, first uh, partner when it, terms, when it comes to export for Canada. And it represents 73% of total exports. It's a large majority of exports. To the US, it's mostly crude oil and cars. Second main trade partner would be China. But you can see that it takes a way lower share of total exports, only 4.31%, mostly vegetable products and paper goods. It's not very surprising to see that in, uh, in main exports, you find vegetable products, paper goods, and crude oil for Canada, as it is endowed with a lot of wood resources, lumber. Lumber industry is huge in Canada also has a lot of crude oil, especially in northern Alberta. And it uh, is endowed with a lot of flat, uh, nice fields, in particular in the prairies, which is pretty much Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, where vegetable products are being grown. The third most important partner for Canada is the UK with 3.21% of total exports, uh, which come in the form of machinery mostly and vehicles. Last, well, fourth main partner of Canada is going to be Japan with 2.6% of total exports, mostly mineral products. Canada, after all, is also endowed with a lot of natural resources, natural mineral products. I don't know if you're aware, but um, Canada is also uh, well endowed with diamond resources. In the north of British Columbia, you have Northwest Territories, where in the north of Northwest Territories, there are some, some big diamond sites that ex where uh, companies extract diamonds, then to be polished and sold for retail. Interestingly, Japan imports a lot of pig meat from Canada. It's very interesting that we talk about pig meat in particular, but uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Wagyu beef and Kobe beef in Japan. So I'm guessing that uh, in terms of farming, there is a lot of um, there is a lot of beef going on. I guess chicken as well, since chicken is also pretty important in um, Japanese diets, but it's mostly fish that um, Japanese eat in terms of animals, and they have a massive fishing industry. Now, what about imports? Well, 
the US are the main partner for exports, but they are also the main partners for imports. So you might think at this stage, well, it could be because of culture. After all, Canadian culture and American cultures are very similar. It could be geographical location. After all, they share a common border, a land border by land, which is pretty wide. And they might also share um, very friendly diplomatic relationships. So Canada imports mostly vehicles, machinery and mineral products. Another interesting fact is that Canada import, imports vehicles, machinery and mineral products, but also, Im but also exports them. Of course, those are different products and they come in various forms, which explains why Canada exports and imports uh, the same category of goods. Second main partner for imports is going to be China, same as exports, but in terms of imports, China represents a, a bigger fraction, mostly machinery, including computers. Then third comes Mexico with mostly vehicles and machinery that could be due to well a um, graphic geographical location after all transportation by land is still cheaper I believe than transportation by sea but also the fact that Mexico is a developing country so it might be cheaper to import uh, things from Mexico than producing them in Canada What about products? The previous slide, I talk about all the different partners and each of the partners um, trade different types of products. But what is the majority of products that Canada exports? First, it's going to be mineral products in the form of oil, gas, maybe diamond and other metals. It represents about 23% of total exports. Vehicles and vehicle parts represent 14.3% of Canada's exports. So they might not assemble cars in Canada, but Canadian firms produce parts that then are going to be shift, shipped to another country. And in that other country, the full uh, product will be assembled. It is the same with an iPhone. You can find online the breakdown of an iPhone production where it takes six, six, or six or seven different firms located in different countries to produce different parts and then it takes another firm in another country to assemble all those parts to obtain a full iPhone. If you think about the LED screen for instance, well it turns out that LG and Samsung are the ones producing the screens for Apple, interestingly. They are competitors when it comes to competing over final products, phones. But Samsung and LG sell their LED screen technology to Apple. Then the GPS um, of, a, of, uh, of an iPhone is made, I believe, in Switzerland or France. Uh, some of the chips are made in the US. Um, the battery, I believe, is also made by Samsung or something like that, at least for maybe a small, like an older model, like iPhone 6. But it's another country that assembles all of these parts. Machinery, appliances and equipment represent about 11.4% of Canada's exports. And for more numbers, I will refer you to this website that has a very, um, very user-friendly interface. And this interface is also very uh, friendly, visually speaking, where you can see each product for each country over different years. You can also look at partners instead of products and so on. You can also uh, narrow down the uh, categories of goods. Instead of just looking at vegetable products, you can look into maybe, I don't know, uh, canola oil, uh, olives, wheat, and so on. So it's a pretty good website to see um, what's going on in um, on the international trade scene. 
You can also find more information on the Canadian Encyclopedia, Nations Encyclopedia, Wikipedia has a pretty detailed page as well, and so on. Now, Canada imports machinery, appliances, and equipment mainly. That represents about 25% of total imports. And that category comes in third position when it comes to exports. Vehicle and vehicle parts is second, almost 20%, which and they are located second as well in terms of exports. Mineral products, oil, gas as well, represent 7.19% of total imports and usually come in a different form than what Canada exports. So it is interesting to see how Canada exports and imports the same categories of goods. But of course, within one category, you have a high, a very detailed list of products. You can find crude oil versus refined oil, crude gas versus refined gas, and they also have semi-refined, I believe, and there are different categories within each type of good. Now, let's talk about the seminal theory of international trade. So here, I'm going to expose you to one of the most fundamental results of international trade. It was uh, found a very long time ago, in the 1700s, but its intuition still remains, although many refinements have been found over the years. Let's start with Adam Smith. Adam Smith, at some point, did some work on specialization. In particular, he was studying productivity in uh, firms. He recommended that a country specialize in the activity for which it has an absolute advantage of, over others in terms of productivity. An absolute advantage is a situation where a country can produce a good for a lower cost than another country. In this case, we will say that country A has an absolute advantage in the production of good one over country B. Now, this makes sense. If it costs you less to produce a good than your neighbor, then you should produce the good. You can sell it to your neighbor it is more efficient and your neighbor can maybe focus on something else, can focus on a good that is cheaper for him to produce. But what happens if a country has no absolute advantage? Think about France, for instance, nowadays. France is a developed, countries, developed country. Wages are pretty high. There are minimum wage laws. Uh, labor unions are pretty strong. Productivity is high, sure, but it doesn't come at a uh, low cost. So I'm pretty sure that France experiences higher cost, like French firms experience higher cost of producing goods if they want to produce them in France. So what should France do? Import everything and export nothing? Well, Ricardo stated, Ricardo came um, out a bit later uh, after Adam Smith, he stated that what matters is not the notion of absolute advantage, but the notion of comparative advantage. What does that mean? Well, I'll get, at, I'll get into that in a minute. So, in his model, he considers two countries, two goods. And he looks at a case where one country can produce both goods at a higher cost than the other. So, one country has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods. With this simple model, he shows that countries can gain from trade, so total surplus can increase, by specializing in the production of the good they are relatively more efficient in. And the word relatively here is very, very important. So, 
Before we get into the model, well, I'm going to explain the model first and then get into the notion of comparative advantage. So let's start with two countries, England and Portugal. They produce two goods, cloth and wine. Now let's look at the following table. It shows the number of hours needed in each country to produce one unit of each product. So for instance, England in England, 100 hours of work are needed to produce one unit of cloth. In Portugal, it takes 90 hours. Now when it comes to wine, it takes 120 hours for an English firm to make a bottle of wine, but it takes only 80 hours for a Portuguese firm to uh, obtain the same result. So you can see that Portugal can produce both goods in less time than England. So Portugal has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods. So if we listen to Adam Smith, we would be thinking, well, then we should just let Portugal produce everything and England will just import. Now, an important thing to look at is look at what England can produce in 100 hours of work. Well, in 100 hours of work, it can produce one unit of cloth. But if it took those 100 hours to produce wine instead, then it would be able to produce five over six units of wine. Okay? Now, let's do the same thing with Portugal. Well, Portugal can either spend, well, a Portuguese firm, can either spend 90 hours working on one unit of cloth, or it can spend those 90 hours making wine, and since it only takes 80 hours to make one unit of wine, with 90 hours, a Portuguese firm will be able to produce 9 over 8 units of wine. Now, comparing England and Portugal, in the amount of time each needs to produce one unit of cloth, England could produce less wine than Portugal. So if Portugal is taking 90 hours to produce one unit of cloth, Portugal is giving up on more than one unit of wine. England, however, would be giving up on less than one unit of wine. And this is where the notion of comparative advantage is going to kick in. England has a comparative advantage in the production of cloth because it's opportunity cost of producing cloth is lower than Portugal's. Portugal, however, has a comparative advantage in the production of wine because its opportunity cost of producing wine is lower than England's. Remember, in the labor economics lecture, I talked about the notion of opportunity cost. This is the next, uh, well, this is the uh, value of the next best option that was giving up, given up on. So if, if England decides to make one unit of cloth, its opportunity cost of making cloth is going to be equal to five over six units of wine. This is what England is giving up, sorry, this is what England is giving up on by deciding to make one unit of cloth. However, Portugal is giving up on 9 over 8 units of wine. So Portugal has a higher opportunity cost of cloth. If it decides to make cloth, it's giving up on more wine than England. So England has a comparative advantage when it comes to producing cloth, because it does not give up on that much wine. 
Portugal, for Portugal, it's going to be the other way around. If it takes 80 hours to make wine for Portugal, Portugal, by taking those 80 hours, Portugal is giving up on more than, uh, sorry, on less than one unit of cloth. If England decided to make a unit of wine, it would give up on more than one unit of cloth. And so you can see how, in spite of having an absolute advantage in both goods, Portugal only has one comparative advantage and England has another comparative advantage. The idea is that it is relatively cheaper for England to produce cloth than wine, and it is relatively cheaper for Portugal to produce wine than cloth. Now, imagine the case where there is no trade. Well, without trade, England needs 220 hours to, of work to enjoy one unit of each good. If countries are not trading, then each country needs to produce both goods. Portugal would only need 170 hours, 90 plus 80. So in total, they would produce two units of each good with this amount of time. England would produce one of each, Portugal one of each. So when you sum them up, you obtain two of each. Now let's formally define the notion of a comparative advantage. A firm or country has a comparative advantage in the production of a good over another firm or country if its opportunity cost of producing that good is lower. Let me remind you the definition of opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of choosing an alternative is the value of the next best alternative that was given up. For instance, I probably have a comparative advantage in, um, well, what do I have a comparative? Skateboarding or maybe table tennis as opposed to basketball. Why? Because I'm really, really bad at basketball and I'm decent at skateboarding and table tennis. So if I decide to take an hour to do basketball or if I decide to do basketball, I'm going to give up on a pretty good performance in terms of table tennis and skateboarding. But if I decide to skateboard or play table tennis, then I am not giving up a lot of good basketball. But if you think about LeBron James, that would be the opposite. If you put LeBron James on a skateboard, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't do very well. But if you give him a ball and net, then he's going to do wonders. So, a country might not have an absolute advantage, but it will always have a comparative advantage as it will always have a lower opportunity cost than another country in the production of a good. So, somebody might not have an absolute advantage, but somebody always has a comparative advantage. For instance, I might not have an absolute advantage in any of these sports as opposed to LeBron James. LeBron James is a phenom. He is a 0.000001% top of the food chain athlete. So he could learn table tennis or skateboarding faster than I learned to do sports. However, as things are now, I have a comparative advantage in skateboarding and table tennis, and he has a comparative advantage in basketball. So let's go to the case where those uh, two countries, England and Portugal, decide to trade and specialize. Well, if England has a uh, comparative advantage in the production of cloth, then let, let's let England specialize in this production and puts all of its 220 hours to make only cloth, no wine. So 
since it takes 100 hours to make one unit of cloth, then in 220 hours, England will be able to produce 2.2 units of cloth. Let's let Portugal produce the wine. It can spend all, it can spend 170 hours, but only on the production of wine. This way, it will make 2.125 units of wine as opposed to one unit of wine and one unit of cloth. Now, if you add up the total number of units made by each country, you end up with more than two units of each good. There is 2.2 units of cloth and 2.125 units of uh, wine. That means that consumption is going to increase as opposed to autarky. So quantities overall increased under free trade. Now, is it obvious that there are going to be gains from trade? No. If you think about it, going from autarky, where each country has to produce both goods, going from there to free trade, where each country is going to specialize, it means that some industries are going to close in each country. For instance, an industry was in charge of making wine in England before. Now that Portugal is going to be the one making the wine, that firm in England is going to shut down. So there might be some pains from trade. However, because the overall quantities increased, and also because they are produced by uh, relatively more efficient countries, then international prices will be probably in favor of consumers overall. So consumers not only will be able to consume more, but maybe also at a lower price than before. To give you another, another example, imagine a lawyer and her secretary. Well, the lawyer can do both law stuff and administrative stuff. Things like sending emails, writing letters, fax things, gather evidence, put them, in, put, put them in, in, in some folder or something. The lawyer can do that, and he could even do that faster than the secretary, maybe. But it is relatively cheaper for the lawyer to do law stuff, because if she decides to do administrative stuff, she gives up on a high amount of law stuff, a high amount of output. And this is the same for the secretary. If you ask the secretary to do law stuff, she will give up on a lot of secretary work because she is better at secretary work, relatively. So the lawyer should specialize in administrative stuff and the lawyer in law stuff. It will be more efficient this way. You can also use this, um, this concept to lead your life. You could decide to invest time and money in an activity that maybe you just like, or you could just say, well, it is something I like and also something I am relatively good at. So you might have a comparative advantage in a given activity, music, art, sports, academics, anything else. And you might want to invest more, more time in uh, that activity as opposed to another. I'm not saying this is what you should do. I'm saying this is something you might be interested in, but to each their own. Personally, I like to invest time and resources in something that I do not know. So in something that I clearly do not have a comparative advantage in. But that's my style. I'm not the style, I'm not really the kind of person who likes to specialize. I prefer to be a jack of all trades. To each their own. Now, the original theory is kind of easy. There is a bit more uh, math involved once, once you want to look at international prices, how the world price is going to be determined and so on, but the intuition is the same. It is one of these models where the intuition is kind of obvious once you know it, but it's not straightforward at all before you learn about it. Now, the model assumes that one country has a comparative advantage in that 
in the production of that good and the other country in the other good. But what determines a comparative advantage? Is it the fact that a country is endowed in natural resources? So if you think about lumber for Canada, there is so much wood in Canada that maybe it's relatively cheap to extract these resources. It's relatively harmless as well. As opposed to extracting uh, wood from an OPEC country that is probably mostly um, desertic. So only a few trees and there might not even be the, the, the appropriate quality to make um, furniture. But OPEC countries, on the other hand, have crude oil. Easy to extract because it's not too deep into, um, into the ground. So it's easy to extract, cheap to produce, and then can be sold. That could be a reason that explains why Canada has such a, a high, such a big lumber industry and why OPEC countries are mostly banking on crude oil to, um, to make business. What about endowment in other inputs? I also mentioned land. Yeah, land is another input. If you have a lot of land, maybe a particular fertile soil, you might want to, um, you might want to increase your farming activity. But what about workers and capital? A country might be endowed with a type of worker that is needed in the production of a certain good. Or a country might be endowed in a specific technology, some capital, that allows it to produce a certain good at a relatively cheaper price. What about history? After all, some countries historically produced some goods, but they didn't have a comparative advantage to start with. They just maybe got good at it as a result of learning by doing. Many industries are like that, many, many countries. They decided to invest resources in a given industry, and it's over time that this country acquired a comparative advantage. Think about Switzerland. This is the number one country when it comes to watchmaking. Is it a result of history? Well, perhaps. But I don't think that 200 or 300 years ago, Switzerland was particularly better at making watches than other countries in Europe. It could be an accident of history that the best watchmakers were in Switzerland and Switzerland maybe invested further in uh, the watchmaking industry so that now we know, um, we mainly know Switzerland for its watches. Moreover, comparative advantage is not a static concept. It evolves over time and trade patterns change as a result. So Ricardo's theory is static. It says at one point in time, one country has a comparative advantage, another one doesn't. But those comparative advantage, advantages can move over time. It is possible to invest, to improve, to leave an industry, to create another one. And those things are, those patterns are going to change over time. So, there have been many different theories that try to refine the notion of comparative advantage over time using some of the points I mentioned and trying to explain why countries export what they export and import what they import. In reality, the real reason is probably a mix of all of these things. I would not be surprised to see the lumber industry in Canada that definitely is related to the natural resources or crude oil for OPEC countries. But why does Canada export so many vehicle parts? Well, that's probably because Canada is endowed with some form of skilled labor, which is needed to produce these goods, or maybe some form of capital. In the 80s, 90s, uh, there were four countries in Asia, we call them the four dragons, that uh, rapidly industrialized as a result of um, developed countries, northwest uh, western countries, sending their production to these Asian countries. These Asian countries were endowed with 
medium to low skilled laborers. So cheap laborers, which are needed to produce uh, goods such as um, textile and shoes. So Western countries in turn, instead of producing the shoes in their country and paying their employees a high amount, they went to these Asian countries that have exactly the amount of la uh, skill labor they need, non-skill labor they need, because the market is so big, they can pay them less and they can save on the costs. This is how Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and China, is it China? Yeah, I think China is the fourth one, uh, got to develop themselves so much, industrialize so much in the 80s, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Now, I want to touch on protectionism. There is international trade, yes, there is free trade, but there are also countries that impose measures to protect their own industries from foreign ones. Many industrialized countries have adopted protectionist measures in their industrialization process over time, like the US, Japan has done it as well, and they have done so in the form of import tariffs. So every time they, every time a American citizen or a Japanese citizen wants to buy a good from abroad, they would have to pay an extra tax on top of the price. The idea behind an import tariff is to favor domestic production. For a while, countries adopted protectionist measures to ensure their domestic demand was met with local suppliers. Make sure that local customers do not only buy foreign goods. So let us quickly look at the impact of an import tariff on the country that imposes it. An import tariff acts as a tax on imports. We have a fairly good idea about the direction where this is going to go since in the taxation lecture, I already covered the case of a quantity tax. Now things are going to be a bit more complicated because we have two countries and we have a world market. So let's look at the initial situation. We have a world market, which will be represented by the middle graph with an equilibrium price PW, the world price. Then we have the home market, which is going to be a net importer because the demand will be higher than the supply. So this extra demand will be able to be satisfied by buying foreign goods, importing them. If the home market is the one that imports, then the foreign market will be the one that exports. And this is what it looks like. So P star is the autarky price. This is the original domestic price without any trade. PF is the foreign price without any trade. Now by opening borders, we can start looking for an import demand and an export supply. Any price below this P star shows that demand is higher than the supply. So any price below P star will lead to a shortage at the domestic level. There will be more people who want to consume, more consumers, than they are available products. So this distance here for a single price, this distance between the demand and the supply will be reflected here as import demand coming from the home country. If you take a lower point like here, this gap here will be represented here. Any difference between demand and supply will result in import demand, demand for imports. The same way I do the same thing for the foreign market. Any price above PF will show a higher supply than demand. So this gap here 
will translate into this gap here. And if you repeat the same process for every price above PF, then you obtain an export supply. This is the amount of goods that this gap here is the amount of goods that foreign suppliers cannot sell to their own customers because their own customers only want this much. So this will be an amount they will put out on the international, on the world market for the home market to purchase. Once import demand equals export supply, you obtain the world price. This is the price that will prevail both in the home country and in the foreign country. Now, there is only one market, the world market, so there is only one price. So let's add a tax in there. A tariff T acts as a tax on the exporter. So we can model it as an increase or yeah, an increase in the uh, cost of providing the good to another country. So it will make the supply, the export supply shift up. So the initial equilibrium is here. Now a tax on imports in particular will act as here an increase in the cost of producing this good to the home market. Note that in the foreign market, the tax doesn't appear because a tariff only happens when two countries are trading with each other. In the foreign market, there is no trade inside the foreign market. So the local foreign customers will not have to pay a higher price. Well, that's before the equilibrium. Now, with the new equilibrium, we obtain a price PT star, which is higher and leads to a lower quantity. That's the usual effect of a tax, right? Now, PT star is the price that the home market consumers will have to pay because this is the price on their imports. Now, if the foreign market wants to produce a good and sell it to their own customer, they do not have to pay a tariff because they only sell to their own customer. So in the foreign market, the price of the good will not be PT star, but rather it will be PT star minus T. That will be the final price in the foreign market. Now, let's look at what's going on in terms of surplus. Well, the initial price was PW. So consumers enjoy all this blue triangle as a surplus. Because the price is not very high, producers only enjoy this much surplus. After the tariff, the price increased from PW to PT star. So consumer surplus is reduced. Consumers lose all of that trapezoid. Producers, however, get to sell the good on the, on the home market for a higher price. So their surplus increases. This trapezoid here now goes to the producers. The government is going to make some revenue coming from the imports. So we need to look at the difference between supply and demand to see how much goods will be imported. At PT star, consumers will purchase this much. Local producers will produce this much. So the difference will be coming from the foreign country in the form of imports. The tax T is equal to the difference between PT star and PT star minus T. So the yellow rectangle here will be the government revenue. Now let's look at the difference between before and after. Note that area A, B and C here used to be here 
they used to go to the consumer. So they used to be consumer surplus. Now, area A and C are not surpluses at all, and area B is part of the government revenue. Note as well area D, which is also part of the government revenue, but it used to be no surplus at all. So on one hand, we have an increase in surplus coming from area D. Area B used to be consumer surplus, now it is producer surp now it is government revenue, so no change there. And area A, areas A and C are, um, are represent a loss in surplus compared to the before tax situation. So the net effect will be A plus C minus D. The relative size of A, C and D will tell whether they are gains from trade after imposing an import tariff. So the net effect is ambiguous. It all depends on the relative size of A, D and C. Here, it looks like area D is bigger than A and C combined. So it seems that here a country is winning by imposing a tariff on their imports. It is not always the case, however. Moreover, for a small economy, import tariffs are unambiguously bad. And I will show this example in a tutorial. I will define what a small economy is, and I will look at how different the result is going to be as opposed to this case here. The idea is that it can be beneficial to impose a tariff if nobody else retaliates with a tariff of their own. If you're Canada and you want to favor the, um, the cheese industry and you decide to impose a tariff on French cheese products, well, good for you. French cheese is going to be more expensive, so people will buy more Canadian cheese. At the same time, friends might decide to retaliate and say, hey, why did you put a tariff on my cheese? I'm going to put a tariff on your maple syrup or on any of your products. So the problem is it can lead to a trade war. And this is one of the reasons why most of the time tariffs drop across country at the same time. Usually countries talk to each other and negotiate the decrease in some tariffs together. Over time, tariffs decreased and trade as a percent of GDP increased. While there is a high correlation relationship here, I cannot tell yet whether it's going to be a causal relationship or not. Did trade increase because tariffs decrease or did tariffs decrease because trade increased? Once people realize how important trade is, maybe they decrease tariffs or they decreased tariffs first and then realized, oh yeah, let's trade more then. That's not clear. Lowering tariffs on one side is also a signal for the other side to lower them too. And once tariffs are lower, no one has an incentive to increase them. So it is a, uh, of course, there is a bargaining process going on, but one of the reasons we see tariff decrease for different countries at the same time is that those uh, tariff, de uh, tariff decreases are negotiated bilaterally or multilaterally. Countries do not lower the tariffs on their own without saying anything. Usually they could say something like, I will lower the tariff on your goods if you lower your tariffs on mine. There has been a rapid increase in bilateral free trade agreements over the past 40 years. European Union is one of them. It's a regional trade agreement that is free of, um, free of, ta of uh, tariffs. If you cross a, uh, if you go from France to Spain, for instance, the only thing you realize is you pay the toll at the, at the, on, the, on the highway. And once you cross that specific toll, suddenly signs are in Spanish, but there is no custom officer that is going to check uh, what I have in my trunk. 
uh, there is no tax to pay, nothing like that. Many countries have done this in the past. Um, they have, there are many trade agreements among, uh, between, for instance, Mexico, Canada, and the US. It used to be called NAFTA, and now it changed for another name. Asian, Asia has a lot of these agreements as well. Uh, Africa has made some sort of like trade unions. And I already mentioned the European Union. One more thing before I finish. So what is the argument behind protectionism? Well, the idea is to help infant industries with a potential comparative advantage to grow and get strong enough to face international competition. So a country might want to develop an industry. The industry is not competitive enough at the international level, so they are imposing tariffs on international competitors so that local customers, domestic customers, will purchase from domestic firms, which will help the industry grow and develop. Now, there are arguments, that's one argument pro-protectionism, but there are also other arguments against this idea of growing an industry. Well, the first argument is, if this industry has a potential comparative advantage, but doesn't have one clearly yet, why should this industry be helped and subsidized by the government, or at least helped via uh, an import tariff, as opposed to just focus on the industry that has a comparative advantage, advantage right now? So it might not be ideal to move today to an industry with a comparative advantage in the future. Also, it doesn't help if the industry does not improve eventually. So you need to make sure that those protectionist measures are going to help this industry be sufficiently competitive in the future so that these protectionist measures will then be dropped. So let me finish. I know I'm a bit late. Sorry about that. There is much more to say about international trade. Again, I barely scratched the surface. Globalization is not a, such a recent phenomenon, but the evolution of information technologies accelerated it. Production now isn't bundled. I mentioned that for iPhones, some parts are made here, another there, another there, and everything assembled in another place. Same for cars. Many goods of this kind are not produced under one single roof. Each part is produced by a firm that has a comparative adv advantage in its production, pretty much. Because of that, countries are more and more interdependent and they share aggregate risks. Think about the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, pretty much a year ago, France didn't have any masks to equip its population. Even uh, um, healthcare workers barely had any equipment. They had to reuse some masks. They could not like, just change them because they didn't, have any, they didn't have enough. At some point, France was about to buy around 60 million masks from um, China. And right about when the plane was supposed to go to France with this uh, shipment, the US made a better offer and that plane ended up going to the United States. My point is, France was relying on other countries for a uh, first necessity equipment, like sanitizing equipment and masks. And when France was in dire need for this equipment, somebody else got priority. And this is the risk. If you don't produce those things and you need them from another country, what happens if that other country needs those, go those uh, goods as well? Then you might not get priority and it might be hard for you to get access to these goods. That's something to take into account. Now let me point you to all the resources to take a look at international trade patterns. This website has a very user-friendly interface and uh, shows you some charts and globalization trades and patterns.
the OEC website also has um, a great amount of resources, a great interface where you can look at um, trade patterns per country, per products, and so on. So I really um, advise you to take a look at um, these resources, at least to know more about what your country imports and exports. That's always interesting to know. And maybe you might find a sector in which to invest time and resources for a potential future career. That's it for this lecture on international trade. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.